Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Loud and clear, Dr. Robinson. Loud and clear. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Hay, my brother, you know, that I have from another mother. And when I say brother, I, I truly mean that. And uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for this opportunity to share on the 7-7 uh, prayer conference. I also want to thank Stacy for queuing up that song for, for me today. And without further, I must say a special welcome to those who are on the line today. I heard somebody, um, I saw someone typed in the chat that she's listening all the way from Jamaica. So thanks for joining. Thanks to all our regular prayer conference attendees. We're so excited to be with you today. Um, today, I'd like to speak to you on the subject, back to basic, back to basic. I'll just read for emphasis, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7, won't you turn there with me? And I'll just read that for emphasis. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord. What appeared to him, let's pray. Gracious Father, in a very special way, God, I pray that you would take full control of this piece of clay this morning and use me in a very marked way to encourage and to inspire your children. I pray that at the end of this sermon that we all will be drawn closer to you and our relationship with you will be at a different level thanks for the transformation through this message and thanks for speaking to us today in jesus name we pray amen back to basic altars in the ancient world Ancient altars were commonly elevated structures or mounds of earth or stones. They were places of divine encounter, sacrifice, and memorial. The first mention of altars in the biblical narrative was after the antediluvian flood in Genesis 8 and verse 20. The word for altar in the Hebrew is Mizbeach, a place for the offering of slain animals. Mizbeach is a four-letter word that has a fourfold significance. It wipes away sin. It nourishes the higher man. So we're talking about the teleological and the epistemological. It fosters love for God. It atones for all guilt. We're talking about ancient altars. In, in our scripture reading today, um, we see that Abram built an altar. The altar was the means of establishing a peace between the patriarchs or people of Israel and their father in heaven. So altars in ancient times were used to solidify that relationship between God and the patriarchs or God and his people. It was a symbol that that person was in connection with the God of heaven. Yes, I know that altars were not only used by the God of heaven, but also by the pagans. But I want you to understand that in the context of Abraham and the patriarchs, the altar was a place that solidified. It was a symbol of an established relationship with God and his people. Abraham, the Bible says, as he entered Canaan, we go back to our scripture reading. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew lot and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. 
At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So here we see that the first thing that Abraham did when he entered the promised land was to build an altar. So in other words, Abraham made sure that he went back to basic because an altar was basic to his relationship with God, basic to his family connection with God. And so as we talk about back to basic, we're talking about rebuilding the family altar. Because you see, friends, the altar is basic to his relationship with God, is basic to his success in the promised land. And God made him a promise. And as a way of celebrating that promise, Abraham erected an altar to God to solidify that covenant relationship. So when we're talking about back, uh, back to basic, we're talking about rebuilding the family altar because that is basic to our connection with God. As soon as Abram got to Canaan, though he was but a stranger and sojourner there, yet he set up and kept up the worship of God in his family. So Abram knew that if he, if, if he were going to inherit the promise, and if, he, if these covenant promises were going to be fulfilled, then the altar was essential to that success, that his connection with God was primary. Abraham, friends, knew and lived by the principle. He or she begins well that begins with God. Maybe you did not hear me. Ab Abraham knew and lived by the principle. He or she begins well that begins with God. And so I'm saying to us, if as families, if we are going to have success, then that simply means that we need to begin with God. And if you did not begin with God, you can align your family with God today. Abraham needed to build the family altar, and also we need to build the family altar because Abraham knew, friends, that the family altar was the place of wrestling with God. It was where you wrestle with God. It was the family altar is the communication tower between heaven and earth. The family altar is a sacred space to encounter the divine. The family altar is a place of thanksgiving. The family altar is the engine room of infinite possibilities. So when you enter the family altar, when you spend time talking to God, that's where you realize that the plans that God has for you and has for your family are far more elaborate than you can imagine. The family altar is the place of divine deliverance. That's where you go and God assures you of the victory. Friends of mine, I want you to understand that Abraham's success in the promised land was based on the fact that he made the altar, the family altar, a priority in his family. Is the altar a priority in your family? Abraham was very instrumental in building altars. Abraham built an altar in Moreh at Shechem, according to Genesis 12, verses 6 and 7. He built an altar in Bethel, according to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8. He built an altar at Mam Mam in Mamre at Abram, according to Genesis 13 and verse 18. And he built an altar 
on Mount Moriah according to Genesis 22 and verse 9. And you understand that probably this was the ultimate altar that he built because it was after sacrificing his son Isaac that the Bible says that Abraham became a symbol of faith. He became the father of the faithful. And so essentially, the, the altar is primary to our success. The altar is primary to us being cohesive as a family. According to the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, Abraham, the friend of God, set us a worthy example. What did I say? A worthy example. His was a life of prayer. Wherever he pitched his tent, close beside it was set up his altar, calling all within his encampment to morning and evening worship, or evening sacrifice, if you may. So the question that I would like to ask you today, what significance? or importance is placed on the family altar? Is it the central thing in your home? Or is it that it's on the periphery of everything else? The way to save the church, according to Richard Baxter, and the community is to establish religion in the homes of the people and to build the family altar. So I want you to understand that in saving the church and also the community, they rely on the family altar or family worship. Because the truth is, excuse me, the church will never become more spiritual than the families that comprise her. The community will never become more spiritual than the families that comprise the community. And so I'm saying to us today that rebuilding the family altar is central to our individual success as a family, central to the success of the church and the community and the nation because the power comes from the family altar. It was because of Abraham's connection with God. It was because of the primary um, significance that was placed on the primary place that the altar occupied in Abraham's house. Why God was able to testify of him. When God is testifying, friends, we have to take note. This is what God says about his friend Abraham. God says, for I know him. God could only say that he, 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 he knows Abraham only because Abraham spent time with God. So God says in Genesis 18 and verse 19, I know him because we have a connection. We spend time. Lots, we spend quality time in great quantity. Can God say that of you today? I know so-and-so. But not only the, that, God continued by saying, in order that he may com command his children and his household after him, God, and that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God was able to testify of Abraham to say that, yes, this is a man that leads his children and is also after me, God, because of the place of the altar, or because of the importance that Abraham placed on the altar in the family. Abraham made sure that the altar or the family altar was primary in his family. And God was able to testify of him. You see, friends, Abraham, like Noah before him, according to Genesis 8 and verse 20, the Bible says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, 
and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So here, what we see is that Noah, rather, Noah, after he came from the flood, the first thing he did was not to build a house for himself and for his family. The first thing he did was not even to secure his food supply. The Bible says that the first thing he did after he came out of the ark was to make an altar unto God and worship him, thanking God for his safety, thanking God for his protection, because Noah knew, friends, that he needed to seek the kingdom of God first. Is the kingdom of God first place in your life? Or probably it's your mansion on the hill. Is the kingdom of God first place in your life or probably it's your dream car, maybe it's your Benz or Lexus or BMW or Ferrari or Jaguar or Lamborghini. But I want you to understand that Hey, now a new friends of mine that he needed to put God first. When the family altar is torn down, are not given priority in the home, these are some things that will happen. In the home, there will be little or no prayer in the home. No regard for the word of God. So the word of God is treated with a sense of disregard. There is increased public disrespect for parents and the authority in general. Marriage loses its sacredness. When the family altar is not made a priority in the home, we have acceleration of juvenile delinquency, promiscuity, and rebellion. When the family altar is not made a priority in the home, we have greater interest and in spread of sexual perversion and sexual related crimes. Because friends, when the family altar is made a priority, the word of God and prayer is made a priority in the home. And these are only the safe God that we can rely on. It was Thomas Hansen of Boulder, Colorado who filed an audacious lawsuit against his parents in 1978. In his lawsuit, he filed for malpractice of parenting. Notice what I said, audacious. Malpractice of parenting. And in this lawsuit, he sued his parents for $350,000, US dollars that is in 1978 and he suit he said that my parents as botch my upbringing bringing to the point that i would need many years of costly psychiatric treatment audacious lawsuit but that's what will happen friends when the family altar is not given primary a primacy in the home. When the family altar is pushed to the side, when everything else is more important than connecting with the divine, when everything else takes precedence. Rebuilding the family altar. We need to get back to the basic by realizing that our primary reason in this life is to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yes, it's important to have a nice house. Yes, it's important to drive a nice car, nice car so that you don't have to, you don't have to, um, every minute you're, 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 you're calling roadside assistance. 
Yes, it's nice to have some extra cash in the bank account, but friends of mine, those are secondary to our relationship with God. Those are secondary to investing our time in our family and making sure that we're preparing for eternity. We need to rebuild the family altar, friends. The centrality of the family altar, listen to this, according to the Adventist home, page one. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. Let me read it again. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influence. And, and I know, friends of mine, we cannot have a good society. We cannot have a successful church or a prosperous nation without spending time at the family altar. Because don't forget, I said earlier that the family altar is a place of infinite possibilities. is a communication tower between earth and heaven. The Adventist song went on to say, a well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gain say. Let me read it again. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that our infidels cannot gainsay, or in other words, infidels cannot counter. But how can you gain a well ordered Christian or sold if you're not praying? How can you gain or, or foster well-ordered Christian or sold if the word of God is not primary in the home? You cannot do that by naturalistic means. And so it's important that we rebuild, that we get back to basic that we make sure that the family altar is firm, that the family altar is solid. And that's what Abraham did, friends. Abraham made sure that even though he was in a strange land, when he got to Canaan, the first thing he did was to build the family altar. He was not, he was not concerned what the Canaanites would say. Because Abraham knew, friends, that he's not massive and cruel, is Jesus and you. There are some of us, when we leave our homeland and we come to a new country, all of a sudden, we are too big for God. All of a sudden, our God that we trusted in back in our homeland, as it were, all of a sudden we are, we are afraid to associate with him. Yes, he brought us to this land of liberty, this land of plenty. But as soon as we get here, we can't stand up for God and stand out for him. Because we're in the United States of America. But I'm saying to us, we need to get back to basic, where God is the most important person in our life, where the worship of God and making connection with God is primary. It is what will set the precedence for everything else. Testimonies. And Sabbath school work, pages 115 and 116 says, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. Let me read it again for emphasis. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. 
I want you to understand that you cannot become loving and lovable where you're loving to others and those who are close by you or those who are close to you or those you come in contact will realize that you are easy to get along and you, 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 you just have this welcoming persona. That doesn't happen by naturalistic means, friends. That is about character transformation. And the best character transformation that I know, or the best character transforming agent that I know, is not psychology, but rather a life of prayer and worship with Jesus Christ. And, 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 and so, you know, it's, it's, it's very important that we rebuild that family altar, that we maintain that connection with Jesus Christ so that the Holy Spirit, the comforter that he has sent us, that he can work in our lives so that he can trip away those things that need to be tripped away and breathe into us new life, a life of great possibility, a life of dignity, a life of infinite word, friend of mine, we need to get back to that place where we can speak into the lives of our children, speak into the lives of our spouse so that we realize that God is in this thing. Get back to the basic of life. Because I think sometimes in the land of the plenty, we forget how the Lord has led us in the past. So preacher, how can we get back to basic? I'd like to share with you a few things that we can use to get back to basic. Our ingredients for rebuilding the family altar. One, prior need to be given a place of priority in the home. As the saying goes, the family that prays together stays together. That is not just a cliche, friends. It is true. I know that prayer will move mountains. Prayer is the most powerful, is the most powerful thing that we have in our world. It's more powerful than armies. It's more powerful than the pen of judges and legislators. But friends, the reason why we are not experiencing the power of prayer is because we are becoming willy wally. We are not praying. We are waiting on political system and politics to do for us what only God can do. So we need to get back to the place of prayer where we can truly say that your house has become a house of prayer for all people. That we can truly claim the promise where God says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Friends of mine, I want you to understand the reason why we are not receiving miracles, the reason why we have in so many problems is because we're not asking. Are we ask amiss? Or we are not knocking and we are not seeking. So one, prayer. We need to bring back the importance of prayer in the home if we are going to get back to basic. Next one, the reading of the word. The reading of the Bible, and this is, this is so important because we read every other book about the Bible instead of reading the Bible. Let me say that again. We read every other book about what the Bible has to say. Instead of reading the Bible, we need to get back to reading the Bible in the home and not merely reading about what others say about the Bible. Let the word of God come in the home and do the cutting and do the transformation and do the realignment. The word of God is powerful, friends. But if it's not read in the home, 
that then we won't have the power of that two-edged sword. If it's not read in the home, then we won't be able to claim those promises. Don't just read what Matthew Henry has to say. Don't just read what Logos has to say about the Bible. Friends, let's get back to the place where we open the Bible and read it in our family. Because there is nothing that anybody else has to say about the Bible that is more powerful than just reading the Bible for yourself. Devotionals are wonderful, but they should not take the place of reading the Bible in the home. Let's get back to basic. Let's read the book for ourselves and not merely what others are saying about the book. Next one is that we want to make sure that we're singing and listening to music that will elevate the spirit. Music is so powerful, friends, that music bypasses the frontal lobe. I don't know if you, if, you, if you have ever had this experience, but I've had it. Where you're traveling, it could be that you're in a taxi, or it could be you're at the mall or somewhere else. And you hear this song, and you didn't think about it. But all of a sudden, your feet start tapping to the music, and you have to catch yourself and say, no, 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 no. This is not the music I should be moving to. You didn't intentionally decide to move to the beat of this music, but for somehow you're moving, for somehow you're rocking, you're tapping your feet because music is powerful, but we want to make sure that we're singing and listening to music that will elevate the spirit. How can we rebuild the family altar? I would say keep it short if you have children. Because children have a very limited attention span, so keep it short if you have children. So that they can have a memorable time of worship. That it will be something that they will relish. Keep it short. Next one, you want to make sure that you memorize scripture. So when we do worship, our children, they memorize. There are four scriptures that they know by heart right now. They memorize John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They recite, and I'm talking about my five-year-old and my three-year-old. They recite Matthew 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They recite Genesis 1 and verse 1, especially in this age of evolutionistic philosophy. They recite Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And they also recite Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So you want to make sure that the children and even the adults, they are memorizing scripture. Because the scripture is so powerful, friends. And that's the only reason why Jesus was able to defeat the enemy. Because he memorized scripture. Next one, you want to make sure that you're modeling reverence for the children. So at the family altar, the children will know how to behave by you modeling that. So when they go to church, they know friends of mine that this is a house of God. This is a worship of God and how to conduct themselves. So you want to make sure you're modeling reverence. The next one, you want to make sure that you're sharing personal testimonies. We talk a lot about that this morning. 
So you want to make sure you're sharing personal testimonies. Let them know what God has done for you. Let them know how God has worked in your life. Let them know how you probably you didn't have any money or something or whatever, but let them know the power and working of God. Friends of mine, we need to get back to the place where we are rebuilding the family or to where we're getting back to basic. Share about his love for you. Share about his mercy. Share about his deliverance. Oh, he came for you for you at the last minute. No food on the table, but God showed up. Share personal testimonies. And I close with a personal testimony of mine. I remember the year was 1991. My mom became a Christian. And when she became a Christian, she started praying for us every day. And sometimes I would hear her praying and I would like, I believed in God, yes. But you know, I would take a casual approach to it. And she would pray and say, Lord, Remember Marla and save him. And sometimes, like Sarah, I would laugh. Not that I did not know that prayer is powerful. And she would pray that prayer for, she would pray that prayer for us every day. One year passed, nothing happened. Two years, nothing happened. But she kept praying. Three years, nothing happened. Four years, nothing happened. But she kept praying because she believed that God was able to move and that God could do something amazing. In the fifth year, I made the greatest mistake of my life, which happened to be the best mistake of my life. There was a program by her church, and I said to my friends, let's go over there to see if we see any young ladies looking like us. Appropriate disclosure, Pastor Hay. And so we went, and night after night, we were not interested in what the preacher had to say. We looked, we looked through the window. But I remember on this night, as I stepped on the church compound, a brother said to me, are your sister Parker's son? And I said, yes. And he immediately turned to me and says, Do you, don't you know if you don't get baptized, you cannot enter the kingdom of God? And I said to him, you have to show me that in the Bible for me to believe that. Though not a Christian, I believed in the Bible, and I still do today. And he turned his Bible to John chapter three and verse five. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And I said, oh, I see it. And I kind of brush him off and say, but as you can see, I'm a young man. I'm not ready to surrender my life to the Lord right now. And so I brushed him off, but friends of mine, when I, I went home that night and I could not sleep. I'm talking about getting back to basic. I'm talking about rebuilding the family altar. And I could not sleep because I felt like somebody sticking me in my heart with a needle. And every time I feel that stick, I could hear the words. If you don't get baptized, you're not going to heaven. And I made a deal with God. Not seriously, but casually. And I said, God, but there are so many churches. And I don't know which one. If you show me, I will give my life to you. Thinking that was a hard 
puzzle or a hard riddle for God to crack. But friends of mine, I want you to know that our God is powerful. Our God is amazing. Our God is life transforming. And the, the more we pray to him, the more we connect to him, he will do amazing things in our lives. And as I made that promise, I felt a peace and a calm came over me that I've never felt before. I went to sleep that night like a baby. So, then three weeks after that, I was in the church at the front, standing, taking my vows. And as I was there that night, because God, friends, is an amazing God. When I went in the church that night, I saw a bird over the pulpit. I don't know if anybody else saw the bird. And when it was time for us to take our vows, the bird flew off and went around the church seven times and went through the window. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but I did. And that was confirmation because seven friends is God's perfect number. Seven friends is God's number of perfection. And I was getting baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Our God is amazing. In fact, on that night, my mom jumped up and said, thank you, Jesus. One down, two to go. She was so excited because she saw five years of prayer came to fruition. I'm sorry, I'm saying to you today, maybe your children are strained. Maybe they have gone astray from God. I want you to understand that the, more, the most powerful thing that you can do is to pray for them. Maybe your husband or your wife is going astray. Friends of mine, take it to the Lord in prayer. Prayer is so powerful, but many times we rely on human instrumentalities instead of the most powerful weapon that we have in the Christian armor is the weapon of prayer. So I'm saying to us today, we need to make sure that we get back to basic. Getting back to basic will improve our family life. Getting back to basic will help us to build successful children. Getting back to basic will improve the quality of the worship and the connection at church. Getting back to basic will do so many things for us. Friends, the promise that was made to Abraham was accomplished only because Abraham's life was a life of prayer, only because Abraham's life was a life of worshiping the God of heaven. Daniel and his three friends, Joseph, that was before them accomplished what they did all because they established that on a life of prayer. And it's no different with us. If you want to experience infinite possibilities, rebuild the family altar. Make prayer and worship a primary thing in the home. If you want to have success in your marriage, and I'm talking and I'm telling you this as a marriage and family therapist, the most powerful ingredient you can have is not the five love languages, though those are powerful is praying with 
and for your spouse and for your children and for your in-laws and for your extended family and for your children that have strayed. The most powerful thing that you can do is pray for them. Take them to the Lord in prayer. And so I say to you today, get back to basic. Your life might have become busy and prayer has been a worship. The family altar has been placed on a back burner. It's time for the prayer altar to become the front burner of your life, the front burner of your family, the front burner of your academic achievements, of your job capabilities, of all the things you do. Let prayer be primary, let worship be the most important thing you do in your life. And so I say to you today, get back to basic because that is what will make you successful here in this earth. And that is what will take you out of this world into eternity. The fact is, we're not just only living for this life. We're living for the life to come because friends of mine, John, reminded us that he has gone to prepare a place for us. And if he has gone to prepare a place for us, yes, our God is faithful. Our God is true. Our God is trustworthy. He will come again and receive you and me unto himself. And so I say to you, whatever you do, make sure you get back to basic. God bless you. Amen, amen. <clears throat> it would have been a miss of me to have shared this message today and not make an appeal. You're there and you're saying, Lord, I want to get back to the basic of life. I want to make you the primary person in my life and in my family. I want to make prayer the primary thing and reading the word and worship as the primary things in my family. Wherever you are, I'm gonna ask you to do two things. First, if that's your desire, you're gonna type in the chat, back to basic. If that's your desire, saying God, I want to make you the primary person in my life above my spouse, above my job, above my house, above my car, above anything on this earth, just tied back to basic. Above my children, above my bank account, whether it's fat or whether it's slim, just tied back to basic. Because friends, what would it profit you. And what would it profit me if we gain the entire world with all its riches and fame? But yet still, we don't make it into the kingdom. What sense would it have? It would have been a great loss. It would have been the loss probably of the ages. And so just type back to basic. Back to basic, back to basic. Yes, I see them coming in. Back to basic. This is between you and Jesus. Because he wants to get rid of this facade. He wants to be real with us. Because many times we allow other things to crowd him out. But now is the time to make sure that he is front and center of all that you do. All right. So you're there. You type in the chat already. I want you to just raise your hand as we pray. Just raise your hand. Uplifted right hand as we pray right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so happy for what you have done for us on Calvary. You are lifted up high so that we could have life, Jesus. You took 
the shame. You took the pain that we should have gone through, oh God, just to give us this opportunity at eternal life. You left all the treasures, the glory in heaven just to come, to die for us. Lord Jesus, help us to understand that this is the supreme sacrifice. Help us, oh God, in all that we do, bring us back to the basic. Let's get back to basic to put you first. Help us that seeking your kingdom and giving you glory, Lord, help that that will be the beat of our heart. Help that that will be the beat of our pulse. Help, our oh God, that that will be every cell in our body. Help, our oh God, that that will be every drop of blood and sweat. Oh, Jesus, may that be firmly planted in our minds that will seek you first and that will give you glory in everything. We thank you. And we praise you for what you have done for us and what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.